So, hey Antonio, I'm so honored to have you on the Everything Saxophone podcast. I'm happy to be here. I'm honored to be here. Thank you. <laughs> Very cool. So, uh, people don't don't realize, but um, when I went to Queens College, I went twice. I went for my bachelor's and then went for, for my master's in music ed. And Antonio Hart taught a class on jazz history, and it really had a profound effect on me. Um, I learned so much in that class, and I remember one of the assignments that we had to do was a like a report and a presentation, and we had to pick a jazz artist. So I picked, even though I was playing saxophones and trumpet, I picked Mary Lou Williams. And um, that was really, I'm so glad I had that assignment. You know, people look at school and it's like, oh, you gotta do all this work, but I'm so glad I had that assignment because I learned so much about her, about jazz history, because she, like Miles Davis, she was, you know, monumental in just about every period of, uh, you know, of the uh, of jazz. But um, you were kind enough to give those of us that asked, like a series, I think it was cassette tapes or something like that, or maybe DVD, uh, CDs, I don't remember. All I know is I have them. I've moved twice since and I can't find anything now. But um, I remember you made those those recordings of jazz saxophone players for me and like, you know, the evolution of what you felt was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a great evolution. I was like, wow, this is, you exposed me to people that I didn't even know about. And I thought it was so awesome. And I said to myself, you know what? This would be great for people, for the Everything Saxophone podcast to know about, you know, jazz saxophone history and who the influential people were and, you know, why you feel that they're influential, you know, and um, obviously the, the, the prominent role that African-American jazz saxophonists have played in, in jazz saxophone history and in jazz history in general. So right. I'm just going to hand it over to you. <laughs> wow that's that's hard you know um you're welcome <laughs> i mean there's so many there i mean there's so honest to be totally honest um there's so many players that i still don't know they're um you know i mean is and there are players in each city around the country around the world that we don't know that weren't these these so-called icons but they were um and i know of a couple in baltimore one in particular his name was mickey fields who was like one of our hometown heroes. He just never got out of um, out of Baltimore for a number of reasons. But they say um, whenever guys came to town, like Cannonball, Adley, Sonny Stead, Dexter Gordon, they always asked where um, Mickey Fields was because it was like they knew if he came on the bandstand, they would have to be on their A game. And I got a chance to see him as a you know as a younger musician, but it was near the end of his life. But anyway. Um, uh, what, what led me to think about history of the saxophone um, was a, a, a professor of mine at Berkeley College of Music. His name was, um, um, whew, wow, Andy McGee, excuse me. <laughs> Andy McGee uh, toured at Berkeley for many years, but he also played with Lionel Hampton and a lot of other players. And what happened was I was in, um, I was in a private lesson with him and he did this this technique on the tenor, he was a tenor saxophonist. And I was like, man, wow, show me that. Show me the technique. He said, no. <laughs> and I was like, no. He said, figure it out for yourself. I was like, what do you mean figure it out for myself? I'll pay you thousands of dollars. Show me that technique. And I was pissed, you know, he was, he was adamant about not showing it to me. So I sat there for a second and something said, well, I would say, okay, if you're not gonna show it to me, how do I learn it? You know, how, uh, how can I get to that? He said, well, you need to go back and listen to these players. Because at that time, I was in like that Kenny Garrett kind of phase of that. That was my main influence, Kenny Garrett, and then checking out some Sonny Stitt and some Charlie Parker. But I was, I was really still new to jazz at that point. So he told me, he said, well, you want to listen to Johnny Hodges? And he gave me a few names. So around the corner from Berkeley, there used to be this used record um, store called Looney Tunes and the guy his name was Lewis that owned it so I went into the Looney Tunes I befriended Lewis and I said man whenever you, you get any Johnny Hodges recordings um, just please tell me and I'll come buy it so it went for you know a couple years that whenever he had something he would let me know or he would hold it for me and I would purchase these um these albums and I still have them actually 
over there. I still have a lot of these records with um, Johnny Hodges because that was like about a five or six year period that he left Duke Ellington's big band and he did a lot of small group stuff. He did stuff with an organ player named Wild Bill Davis. And um, so I, I have all those recordings. And then Mosaic at the time would come out with all these different box sets. And they came out um, with two box sets of Johnny Hodges. Um, one was, um, you know, like small group stuff um, when he was still with Duke Ellington and this stuff in that period when he was not with Duke Ellington. So that was what actually started the germ of me um, going back. And then when I did the research, they always say when, you, when you're studying somebody, go back and try to see who did, who did they listen to? Who did they listen to? You know, so you can't go back any further. And I realized um, or I learned that his teacher was, was Sidney Bechet. All right. And in terms of documented history, probably it would start with people like Sidney Bechet. You know, even though he was a, a virtuoso clarinet player and we know him for playing soprano. All right. So, but there are some recordings in the 30s of Johnny Hodges playing soprano, sounding just like Sidney Bechet. Oh, wow. You know, so that was that's part of the lineage. So for me, it starts with Sidney Bechet, and then I would go to Johnny Hodges, and then you have Benny Carter, the giants of the alto saxophone. You know, you had other guys that played alto saxophone and other instruments that are there. You know, like you know, you know Don Redman who played oboe and all these other instruments too. Um, and, you know, Benny Carter, um, Marshall Royal with Count Basie, um, you know, those are like the early guys that I checked out. Um, there's another alto player named Tab Smith, um, another one named Willie Smith, not Willie the Lion Smith, the piano player, but Willie, Willie Smith. Um, those are like the early guys that I checked out. And then it get to like people like Earl Bostic. Um, Earl Bostic is kind of like the... He's, he was around during the time of Charlie Parker and those guys, but he was like, for me, like in the King Curtis kind of thing, he was like in a mix of like tradition and what they call R&B or like funk root saxophone player. He played with a growl. Um, they say he was, um, I might even talked about him in that time in class. They said he was like just such an amazing technician. He was playing in the altissimo range um, way back then and, and very clean. And they said he could look at a saxophone. He could look at a saxophone and tell could it, what it could do before he even played it. And and they said whenever Charlie Parker, whenever he was playing and Charlie Parker was around, he would be in the audience checking out Earl Boston, you know. And then you have like people like Louis Jordan, you know, and that's more the the the, the R and B kind of side or what became R and B side of um, saxophone. Those, those are the people. I'm just telling you the people that kind of influenced me, you know. And then. I, I got into, of course, Charlie Parker, Sonny Stitt, Jackie McLean. Um, later on, um, once I matured a little bit, I got into Paul Desmond, who I love. You know, no, I, I respected Lee Koenig. It wasn't somebody that I checked out, but I knew he was important in the tradition. You know, and then Ornette Coleman, my man Eric Dolphy. And, you know, and then gets into, you know, some of the the, um, the contemporary players. You know, like I said, I, at, at that time I was checking out Kenny Garrett, but then you had Donald Harrison, you had, had Greg Osby, you had Brantford Marcellus that was playing alto before he switched to tenor, you know. And that, you know, so, and then, and then it goes into, like, some of the younger players, you know, like the Jalil Shaws, um, the Braxton Cook, um, um, uh, uh, Terrence Martin, um uh what's his name miguel xenon um another one his name is godwin i can't think of his last name godwin is, is a monster um i'm trying to think i mean you know it's, it's, it's just this whole thing and, it's, and I, I hear these new young guys all the time and I'm, I'm missing a lot of people and i don't want to offend anybody because for me they're all great you know they're they're anybody that puts in the time on an instrument where I can hear that you studied the history and I, I don't need to hear you play like anybody because that's who they are. You're an artist. I want to hear who you are, but I want to hear that the history is inside your playing, you know? So I don't want to hear a Charlie Parker solo. I have Charlie Parker recordings or a John Coltrane solo. I have that. Oh, of course. And I forgot the grandmaster, you know, I, I think I said Jackie McLean, but Gary Bartz, you know, me is that's that's my you know. There's no favorite, but that's the one that resonates with my my soul 
the most. And I think partly because I heard him, he's from Baltimore and I heard him a lot. You know, we had another guy in Baltimore, Arnold Sterling and, uh, you know, sitting next to Frank West, <laughs> the great Frank West, who played amazing alto and, and it's part of the, the, the total lineage of, you know, of that playing. So, I mean, each one of those players, you have like a tree of, of guys that were influenced by them and different parts of the music, you know. Um, like I said, you had, you know, you had Johnny Hodges, you had Russell Prokoff, you had, um, was um, Norris Turney, who took the place of Johnny Hodges after after he passed away, you know, um, and, and, and so many guys in, in each band that were just, um, that gave a little bit of themselves to the lineage of the saxophone. So that's kind of where my studying has gone. And, you know, I try to see each player for different things. Like for me, Johnny Hodges, for me at first was just sound, you know, then I could hear the intelligence of how he, created his solos or developed his solos, um, articulation, you know, talking and, and phrasing and um, spirit, you know, each person has something different. You know, when I, when I hear, like when I hear Cannonball Adley, I hear all the intelligence and the brilliance, but then I hear church, I feel church, something that I grew up in, something that identifies, that I can identify with. Charlie Parker, I hear total surrender and honesty within, you know, with brilliance in terms of um, intellect and genius, you know, total freedom. And it's, it's, you know, I've heard tapes of him when he was young, 17 years old, 18 years old, where he was still, he played like that already, you know, wow. you know, wow. so he had, he had something pretty special, you know, um, each player gives me something different. And it's funny, you know, I would listen to a recording that I've heard 20, 30 years and because of my music, my ear is changing, my musical palette is changing, I'm getting more mature. I, I hear something in it that I didn't get before, you know, especially when we're young player, alto players. Of course, we listen to Charlie Parker. We just want to play as fast as Charlie Parker. We want to play all those lines, you know, and we plan the notes, but then it goes deeper than that. It's like, how did he play that? How did he phrase it? Where did it feel? Like, you know, you can't, you can't write that down. The Omni book is great you know, with all the solos, even though there's some mistakes in it, but you can't write down what Charlie Parker played. You can write down the notes, but it's like, what was the articulation? What was the dynamics? What did he do in each register of the horn? You know, that's, that's when you get into the personality and the spirit of, of, of a person. So like, because I've done a lot of that, I could play in the spirit of Cannonball Adderley and people say, you're playing like Cannonball. I mean, you're playing, can I'm not playing his vocabulary, but I'm playing in the spirit spirit of him or in the spirit of Charlie Parker or in the spirit of Johnny Hodges and it's not just glissandos and bending notes it's just the, the essence of that person and and I think that's um that's something very very important for all of us and I mean we're just talking about alto saxophone but then you got you know you got Coleman Hawkins and Ben Webster and Chewberry and Don Bias and all these people before you get to Dexter Gordon and then we get into you know all the other players after that you got you know um well, he wasn't recorded, Buddy Bolden, right? You got Freddie Keppard. You got Louis Armstrong, or excuse me, King Oliver. You got Louis Armstrong, you know, Roy Elders, Dizzy Gillespie, Clifford Brown, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I think anybody that's studying anything, that's what you do. So you made a reference earlier to, to Kenny G. If that's where people start, I don't have a problem with that. It's like, but who did Kenny G listen to? Who was he influenced by? You know, because, you know, their recordings – you can't say that Kenny G can't play the saxophone. It might not be something that you want to digest or hear. Kenny G can play the saxophone. He just chose a style of music. But where did it come out of, you know? So it goes back, again, goes back to King Curtis, goes back to Louis Jordan. It goes, you know, goes back to all those earlier players that, that kind of went down that direction. Then you got to bring in Hank Crawford. You know, you have to bring in Grover Washington Jr., another one, George Howard. You know, like the George Howard died, you know, they're, you know, all these players that play what they call smooth jazz, you know, but, you know, then you have um, um, Kirk Whalum. I mean, there's, you know, um, I mean, there's so many names in that, in that genre too, you know, but that influenced David Sanborn, you know, Michael Brecker, who kind of went across the lines of all that stuff, you know, all those guys from Saturday Night Live and all that, you know, all that music with Jocko and all those guys. So, I mean, we have to know these people and know why they're important and what that contribution is, not just their names. I think that's the most important thing. It's, it's easy to spit out 
a lot of names and you can say I have these recordings, but like really studying these people and know why they're important to the shape and how people play, you know? I can't hear you. I muted myself, sorry. Let me ask this question then to you because I was curious about this. As you were saying this, um, you know, one great point, just as a recap, you know, whoever you like, then you figure out who influenced them. I think that's so important. And I think that, you know, um, many people maybe don't do that. But what to you, in your definition, you're saying people that contribute, you can hear the history, you know, in their playing. What else are you listening for that would make you say, you know what, this person is really important in the, in the tree, in the jazz saxophone tree, uh, history tree? You talking about somebody new or just someone that I've heard? Uh, um, it could be someone that you've heard, or it could be even someone new. We were, you were mentioning some names. Um, you could even, you know, mention someone like uh, on tenor, Chris Potter. You know, yeah, an amazing player. Well, right? yeah, that's yeah, Chris. I played with him a lot with Dave Holland, and uh, like almost every situation of Dave Holland. Um, Chris, you know, he came up early. He was a, a whiz kid. I think at 14, 13, 14, he was already doing gigs on alto before he switched to tenor. Um, but he had a, he had great exposure besides being like super super talented. Um, the thing about Chris is that just that he did that homework. You know, Chris started with the early guys. I don't know how far back he's gone, but definitely um, through the bebop period and working his way up to you know his own um, stylistic approach to playing the saxophone. Um, he's definitely important because he's influenced a lot of young people you know, in, in different styles of music. Um, there are a lot of guys like that. Um, Chris, Seamus Blake, um, Josh Redman, Chris Cheek, um, you know, guys I went to school with. And um, I'm trying to, like, I, I feel bad because I don't want to omit anybody because there are a lot of guys that just don't pop into my head that I, I have listened to that I think are important. Um, for me, I don't think so much in that fashion. I just think of how they make me feel. The people that I, I choose to listen to are the ones that make me feel good or intrigue me in some way. So say if I, after playing years with Chris, like I had a chance to just watch his um, thought pattern, his development pattern, you know, how rhythmic he, he was, how intelligent he was in terms of being an architect of putting things together his statement, you know, and he used, you know, a lot of technique, um, a lot of advanced techniques on the saxophone to get his point across, and that's how he expressed himself. And then I would hear somebody else, like, say, um, in that band, say, the, the Dave Holland bands, and that maybe uh, Mark Turner was in the band. You know, same thing, a very technical player, very methodical player, but in a different kind of approach, you know, or I listened to Gary Smolin playing baritone, and, you know, everybody has their, their approach in how they play. Some people are technic, a lot of technique. Some people have a lot of harmony. Some people have a lot of rhythm. And then you take somebody, like I said, like a Chris Potter or, or Gary Smoley or Mark Turner or James that, that have everything. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and that's, I think that's what's important is like having, shaping all of that and being able to put that together and make a musical statement, you know? And that's what separates, like, the, the great players from the great, great players, you know, where we say they have something special. They were able to tune into the history. They were able to, to digest the history. They were able to make it personal. And then now they're able to disseminate it in a way that makes it sound personal. And their own unique voice. That's what art is. You know, that's, I mean, that's the ultimate level. Like I was talking to somebody yesterday. I was thinking about that because I'm, I'm also a martial artist and it's the same kind of process, you know, you study your foundation, your forms, you, you, you study where hand placement is, where everything's supposed to be, right? And then you learn how to use it. You study different masters. This, is, this system does it this way. This study, this system does it this way. So years and years of practicing and getting it digested into your body and your DNA, when something happens, you don't think about it anymore. You don't think about it, you, you just respond, right? Same thing with playing instruments. My, my plays in harmony or something, you respond to it. You get that, and then you figure out a personal approach to it. And then the highest level, which we, we should all be striving towards, is the, the spiritual. You know, where, where actually we can, get out of, we can get out of the way, and then the, the ultimate can be used as a filter to, to, to spread his message through us. 
you know, that's, I, that's what I feel like with all the great masters. And I know it's true. Um, before Frank West died, he was 92 or 93. I would visit him in the hospital. But one time I went to his apartment when he got out, it was maybe three months before he passed. And he was playing with a, a guitar player. He was playing flute. And I got there and they said he had been playing for like two hours before I got, got there. And when I got there, we played for another two hours. And, you know, like at this time he was really sick. He was irritable, you know, but I get goose pin, goose, goosebumps when I think about what he was doing, because even though this was his medium for expressing himself, it wasn't a flute anymore. It was just somebody talking and every note was like a universe. You know, you always hear that, you know, it's like, it, it was, it was one of them times where I experienced it and I've experienced it in other situations, but like actually like the whole time, because it wasn't as clean. It wasn't executed like he always was. He was called magic because he was just magical. But that, that day taught me a lot about music. It taught me about surrender. It taught me about how powerful music can be. And, and, um, that was, that was very important to me. And then I saw that when you hear, when you hear people play and like, you, you can't explain why you feel the way you feel. You can't explain, like, what the heck was that? You know, one time I was on the road with Roy Haynes, and I remember we were in Seattle, and he was taking this solo, and the room got, the air in the room got really thick. I mean, like, you could feel the room, the air in the room get thick, and, and people stopped talking. Everybody was glued into Roy Haynes, and I'm looking at Roy Haynes, and when he played, it was like this magical thing i mean i'm watching him play the drums but it wasn't the drums anymore it was something it was something very very spiritual you know and i think that's that's a level to to get to you have to play a lot you have to you have to surrender to that and you have to be open to get to that but that's that's like more of an esoteric kind of thing if you think about it right but i think that's the that's it we want to connect with spirit and if we can connect with spirit in a positive way positive or negative we have the the ability to affect the world. We have a power to affect the people that are listening to us in a profound way. You know, when people listen to a love Supreme because of the message with, with John Coltrane and, and um, um, Jimmy Garrison and McCoy Tyner were doing was like what they were trying to do in terms of saying, thank you and connecting with spirit. That's why when we listen to that, but you also hear when you listen to Charlie Parker, listen, you let you hear Clifford Brown, all the great guys, especially like people like James Moody, um, Mr. Heath, Master Heath, yeah. um, Slide Hampton, you know. But these are guys that have been, they've been playing for 50, 60 years, you know. So even though they were still practicing, Sonny Rollins, it, it went to the next level, you know. So I think that's very important, you know, to gravitate towards the players that make you feel good, you know. You know, gravitate gravitate towards the players that that intrigue you intellectually. You know, and everybody has something different to offer. There's for me, there's nobody better than anybody. I don't say, well, this person can't play. Obviously, I said that about Kenny G. I've checked Kenny G out. In fact, um, we were in um, Thailand. I was with the Dizzy Gillespie band, and he was over there. I was on the side of the stage watching his set because I wanted to see. You know, everybody in the, in the band, oh, that kid, blah, 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 right? And I was like, well, I want to see what this is. So I stood, I stood on the side of the band saying, when I heard him play, I mean, it wasn't like he was doing anything miraculous or special. But the one thing I did notice was everybody in that audience was having a good time. Yes, yeah. People were smiling. They were clapping their hands and having a good time. And, and a lot of musicians and some, sometimes the so-called jazz musicians forget that. Yes, you're artists and you're expressing yourself, and you're, you, you want people to get what you're doing, and sometimes they don't, but you're also an entertainer. And the great guys were really amazing at that. Dizzy Gillespie was great at that. Yeah. Um, Mr. Heath, um, James Moody. How many times did I watch him sing Moody's Move for Love? I'm sure he didn't want to sing that song anymore, or Pennies from Heaven. He had to do it because that was his hit. And every night was a home run. Every, I would look at it and say, Master Moody, home run uh, thank you, Antonio. you know every night you know and it was like um that's that's so important all those things are so important you just just find somebody that you like try to get into that spirit and try to figure out what is it about them that you like 
you know, I hear Miles Davis play. I listen, I, we've all heard Kind of Blue a million times. And it's still, I can't even do it. Like, and I'm like, I just feel it in my soul. Just a couple notes, you know. Yep. I mean, you know, it's just something simple. It's all like, maybe that's how you express yourself. And there's nothing wrong with the two, you know. But like, when I feel like, you see, my, my whole body language changed just hearing the solo and feeling the, you know, feeling Paul Chambers and those guys playing and Jimmy Cobb, you know. So um, I think, I think. Gary Bartz talks about this. People need to listen more. We've got in, so far in, in terms of um, in terms of academia, and knowledge, and information, and pyrotechnics that people will play music here. I know what to play. I know what works. But I always tell my students when they play something, I say, "Did you hear that before you played it, or you just thought about it?" They said, "Well, I think I heard it." And that's like, no, you should hear what you play before you play it. And it should be a conversation like. You know, I'm, I'm talking more instead of, you know, us going back and forth. But, you know, it's a conversation. You're, you're not just giving information. You're just, you're supposed to be talking. So that's the call and response and, and, and um, connecting with the band that's playing around you. Because if you just play and play and play, and I had to learn this, you know, it's just maturing. The band becomes a Jamie Ambersall tape, you know. So they're just backing you up. You might as well have a Jamie Ambersall backing you up because there's no connection with the rhythm section. And a lot of times the rhythm sections, they get into their own thing. So they're having a good time with themselves and they look up, oh, he's finished. Okay. You know, you know it's like, there's, there's, cause you're not giving them anything to connect with you. You know, and like I said, I've, I've definitely been a culprit of that. Um, and I've learned to listen. Gary Bartz really um, taught me that you have to listen. So those, those musical elements of space, you know, rhythm, things that you can do to have people engaged. Repetition is so beautiful, you know? So I, I, I stress that. And the, the players that I like do that naturally, the Cannonball Adelies, um, the Johnny Hodges, the Gary Bartz, you know, all, all the great players, they do that because I think they thought of their instruments like a voice. It wasn't just a saxophone. It was their voice. A lot of young guys today, and it's not their fault, um, and women, because there's some amazing female saxophone players out here, truly amazing. Sherelle Cassidy, Tia Fuller, um, Lauren Savian. Um, I mean, it's, um, I forgot the young ladies, a couple young ladies that, go, that went to Juilliard. I mean, I've heard, I've heard some really phenomenal. Um, Lakeisha Benjamin, um, Caddy Rodriguez was my student with Beyonce. I mean, so, so many, so many great female um, saxophonists now, you know, so, um, yeah, you just got to be curious. You got to be curious. You got to be searching. You have to do the homework. So going back to that initial um, statement, I think it's important. Anybody that you like, try to find out who that person listened to and go back until you can't go back anymore and then then work your way back up to that person. And then you'll probably hear the evolution, the growth, and see how they got there. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, um, I know um, when I went to Queens College, Jimmy Heath started the jazz program there. And I know he's been a major influence on you as well. And you can definitely hear history in Jimmy Heath's playing as well. He was history, you know? Yeah. I mean, you know, they used to call him Little Bird because yeah. um, he sounds so much like Charlie Parker. And, um, you know, he spent time with Charlie Parker. Uh, Charlie Parker, I think one time Charlie Parker came to Philly and borrowed Mr. Heath's horn for like a week. And Mr. Heath would go after the gig every night and get his horn because, you know, if he didn't, that horn might disappear, oh, you know, God. you know, so um, he always told that story. Um, but, you know, Mr. Heath was always studying. He was always curious. I mean, that music was the music of their time. You know, I mean, his first tour, he went on, went to Europe with Howard McGee. And the headliner of that, of that tour was Coleman Hawkins at that time. He was like the grand Coleman Hawkins, you know, and that's after body and soul, you know, got big. So, you know, Mr. Heath has been around the whole history. He's a part of it. He, there, there's some flyers he showed me where he introduced Clifford Brown. It was a, instead, before he became Clifford Brown, it was like Cliff Brown, you know? Um, he had a big band that had Benny Golson and John Coltrane. 
and, and you know, in Philly, all these people, it's a picture, a famous picture with Charlie Parker playing in front of them, and, and John Coltrane has a cigarette in his hand looking at Charlie Parker, like, you know. Wow. So, you know, and all of the, the big band writing, the small group writing he's done, and, you know, the Heath brothers, that, that history is just so amazing because, you know, when they were with Columbia, they kind of were a crossover group, but they started playing a little more groove-oriented music. Um, during that time. Yeah, Master Heath has two recordings coming out um, hopefully soon. One is a, a recording he did with vocalists, which is, I mean, he did it literally days before he passed away. And I had a chance to hear some of it, some of it and um, the same thing I said with Frank West. Oh, wow. You know, brought tears to my eyes. And then we did a big band recording Hopefully that will come out after he wrote some new charts and the band really played well. So um, total inspiration of somebody that really didn't take time lightly and really pushed himself to the very end. And somebody that was just um, full of love. You know, we spent 30 years together, me, him being my mentor. And um, you're talking about somebody that was very spiritual without preaching the Bible without talking about church, but was more spiritual than people I know that can quote every every scripture in the Bible, you know? Um, a father, a husband, you know, made mistakes in life um, and, and had an appreciation for every moment until the last moment, you know? So um, I was very, very fortunate to have him in my life. Yeah, he, he was... Um... He was a great influence, you know, at Queens College, and I remember playing in the big band on trumpet, and um, wow, that music was so challenging. <laughs> I'll never forget <laughs> crazy fast yeah. tempos and intervallic leaps of, of, you know, fourths, fifths, and, and you know, at crazy speeds, and, um, but it was just so, his music is so endearing, you know? It's just so endearing. You can really catch on to it, and you said something interesting before about, you know, we can't forget that we have to be, we're entertainers. And, you know, uh, people choose various genres to play. Um, but, you know, I know Kenny G can play because I've heard him play. I've heard him play other types of things. I've heard him play, you know, uh, some jazz. Yeah, Jeff, Jeff Lober, Jeff Lober and all stuff. Yeah, he can play. He yeah. can play the horn. I mean, like I said, it's, it's every, a lot of that is just hating, you know. He got popular. You know, for whatever reason, he was, he was blessed. He got lucky. He got popular. And, you know, people liked him. And, I can't be mad at that. What for me, when I see somebody gets popular like that, I want to know why. Now, of course, he had a big machine behind them. They they tore support, a lot of press. That has something to do with it. But he had to. He still had to like demonstrate the goods, you know. But I but I do that when anybody that's popular. I remember um, I'm kind of going off topic, but you know, like I used to see people with um, this guy on that shirt with the, with with dreadlocks, or I see him and then see the the marijuana leaf, and I say, oh, these must be a bunch of potheads, right? Um, and it was Bob Marley. I thought that's what that was about, right? Just, you know, getting high and Rastafari, whatever that meant. But then I was curious. I said, all these people like this guy. Let me check him out. So I started listening to, like, all his stuff. all the way, And I went back to the rude boy, rude boy period when he had the Afro, before he even had the locks, before he became, like, a Rastafari. And then I started listening to all the words of his songs. And I was like, man, this guy was a poet. He was brilliant. Not only a poet, he was an activist, you know, and his music changed the world. He was talking about political situations. He was talking about stuff that was happening in Jamaica. He was talking about stuff that was happening on the continent of Africa. He was talking about world conditions. He was talking about love, you know. He, he, I mean, brilliant. And the same thing. Everybody talked about this group from, from Liverpool called the Beatles. And I heard about the Beatles, the Beatles this, the Beatles that. And I was like... I don't care about the Beatles. And I was like, well, let me just check this out. So, okay, the White Album. It's supposed to be the, like the thing. So I listened to it. And then I was like, wow, this, this guy, John Lennon and Paul McCartney had something. Then this group Queen, everybody knew, we will, we will rock you. I heard that as a kid, right, as playing baseball. Then I'm like, damn, these guys were bad. You know, and, and I, Jeff Beck. I mean, I could tell you about a, a bunch of people that I just checked out because they were popular. And I wanted to know why thousands and thousands of people like that music and a lot of it is because they were amazing entertainers 
the spirit that came through that music. You know, a jazz musician, sometimes we get on our, our soapbox because, oh, the harmony is basic, or this is, sometimes that's, a, that's what it's called, that's all it's called for. You know, the, the, the art in, in any kind of art is to, to make it seem simplistic, but under the hood is very advanced, you know? So when you hear those great players, they're, you know, all of them, they'll play something really simple. It seems like it's like nothing to it, but when you go to try to do it, you be like, oh my God, people try to, they still try to play like Louis Armstrong. And they, they realize how advanced he was <laughs> back then with yeah. those, those trumpets and cornets and stuff that they had back then, you know? It's um pretty amazing. So, I mean, I, I got off the subject, but yeah, it's, if, if you like Kenny G, great. If you like David Sanborn, great, who I like. You know, if you like any of those players, if you like Paul Desmond, you like anybody, listen to them. I'm talking to saxophone players. I say, yeah, continue to listen to them and try to find out who they listen to. Listen to what some of the young guys are doing because Dizzy Gillespie said you should have one foot in the past and one foot in the present. You know, I probably could listen to a, a lot more to, to some of the younger guys um, I just need to clear my ears for a little while, but there's some there's some some great talent out there. The music is in good hands. Um, just we just got to see what's happening in society right now. And, you know, things are crazy and guys can't play, and um, that's that's a drag, yeah. you know. But it's some very 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 talented um, musicians in the world, you know. Um, oh, I forgot about Sherman Irby with with um with uh, Wynton Marcellus and um, I mean, it's just every, so many saxophone players that come to mind, guys that I really admire for, for different things, you know, some great, great Walter Blandon with Wynton. Um, what's the other alto player with Wynton? Um, well, Wes his Anderson father was a famous saxophone player, huh? Wes Anderson was with Wynton? Oh, Wes with, um, yeah, yeah, Wes Anderson, um, Tad Nash. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, um, I mean, it's just, I mean, there's just so many, the, the list goes on and on of so many great musicians that play differently, have different things to offer. And, you know, we should just support each other, you know? We're, we're trying to play this music that's not a popular music anymore. And, you know, if you're able to do this, and you're able to make a living at it, and or it just makes you happy. Because <laughs> that's why we started playing music anyway. It wasn't, for me anyway, it wasn't about making money or making recordings. I didn't even think that was possible for me. All I knew is like, I just wanted to play the saxophone. I wanted to play on a level where I could play with good players. And I wanted to be on a level where the, the, the great players would take me under their wing and I could be a part of this musical fraternity. Yeah, and it. you know, so many things to unpack here too, because you're talking about mentorship and seeking out you know, people to be mentored by, you know, regardless of, you know, your amazing skill set that you have, you know, it never, learning never stops, right? Jimmy Heath said the same thing. He never stops learning. Um, I'm curious about this too, though. Um, let's, let's focus on the blues for a second, if we can. And you, you talked about like simple harmonies, right? There's nothing more simple than a basic one, four, five blues, yet the playing, you know, the, the, um, the expression, the uh, connection with the audience I think is huge when it comes to that. Do you have, you know, any, um, I guess, suggestions or, you know, advice or whatever in terms of like, you know, blues saxophone, you know, um, uh, people to focus on or to listen to? Oh, well, I mean, you know, you just, you, you just said something like, you know, the one, four, five, or whatever the progression is, that's something that academia came up with. Right. So what, and I, <laughs> I, I had a discussion with a professor, um, about this and they're of the European um, classical tradition and they the, the comment that this person made was that the blues wouldn't be anything without <laughs> with the the tonal harmony of white people basically that's what the person said and I and I took offense to that for a number of reasons but I had to tell this person that that's not the blues the blues, in my humble opinion, is being taken from the continent of Africa, being on a ship for several months, stuck on a ship, not knowing where you're going, people telling you what to do, you don't know what they're saying, 
seeing people dying next to you. So they throw them off the ship and they're eating by, they're eating by sharks. So sharks are following your ship. You're taken to Europe, you're taken to the Caribbean, you're taken to America. You're stripped of your language, your family, you're taught a new language, you're forced to work, you're taught this new God, you're giving all these things, you're in this condition. That's the blues, you know? Now, the structure part of it, of putting it in an academic situation, yeah, that, that's something that the West helped contribute to that, and there was a blending of cultures. But the blues comes from a condition. Everything comes from a condition. This thing that we call jazz comes from a condition of a people. Now it's worldwide. I've gone all over the world and everybody loves jazz. It's not because of one, four, five, two, five, one has nothing to do with that. It's because of how it makes them feel, right. period. So, you know, anybody that's trying to play what they would call the blues. And the thing is, if you're playing jazz, you're supposed to be playing the blues because they're, 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 they're together. It's not the blues is here and jazz is here. People always say that. No, it's all together. It's one family, you know? And it comes from those experiences, the cotton field and all stuff. Then it comes from the church, which is very, very important. So that's, you asked me about that. You have to know something about the African-American church. So you have to know those, those at least study those songs, those hymnals, and hear it and listen to the famous recordings. Listen to Mahalia Jackson and James Cleveland and Molly Clouds of Joy. And I mean, just, you know, all those, the Clark sisters and even up to some of the contemporary gospel that's more, sounds like more R&B-ish, but still the inflections and things are still there. You have to do that. Um, you have to listen to Son House and John, um, um, what's his name? Um, um, Son House and the, the guys from the Mississippi Delta. There, there's, you know, um, a bunch of people from there. I can't think of, not John Patton. But I can't think of the names. Um, but you want to listen to all that stuff. Um, and, and I had a chance to go down there in Mississippi. There's a place called Dockery Farms, where a lot, where like it was supposed to be the home of where that Delta Blues came from. Um, that's just that's just a part of the music, and and you want to listen to it. And like I said, jazz is not like this one four one two five one that twelve bar blues because some of the blues weren't even progressions like that. It might have been just one chord, you know, might have been one guy with a guitar just playing one chord and it, those inflections, that rhythm, you know, that, that was the blues. And, and what, what he was talking about, and it gets back to music, it's supposed to be a statement. What are you talking about? I'm talking about I don't have a house. I don't have money. I don't know how I'm going to eat. I'm on this train. I'm a hobo. And I'm going from town to town trying to survive. Or I'm talking about some dude, you know, a woman. This dude that I love, this guy just beat me, this guy treated me bad. Or, you know, it doesn't always have to be, and it doesn't always have to be this horrible story, as we know. It could be something beautiful. Um, it's just knowing history, you know? If you want to, if you would really want to get into that, and then you will see, you know, you, I mean, people know about B.B. King and, and, and some of these other players, you know, John Lee Hooker and, and people like that. Um, that you just listen to that music, you know? And you'll hear aspects of it that are in when you hear Johnny Hodges playing with, with Duke Ellington or you hear you hear Charlie Parker playing the blues or you hear other people playing the blues. Though All those things, those inflections are a part of that, but it's like talking, you know? And people, I think people get it misconstrued that the blues are just about these progressions. Oh, this is the Charlie Parker blues. And also, yeah, this is the way he expressed himself. But how did he play over the composition? What did he do? to make you say he's playing the blues. And it's not just a flat third on a dominant chord. You know, it's like, it's not the blues scale. That's academia. That's, that's what they teach you and give you a foundation. But that's, that's, the, that's like the beginning level. That's like level one. We're trying to get to the higher levels and there's expression. What did he, what did he or she do on that note that make you feel like in that, in that, that evoked that kind of emotion where you said, yeah, that's blues or bluesy, you know? Was it a straight tone? Was there a vibrato? Were they bending? Were they growling? You know, was it loud? Was it soft? What, what was it about it that they gave you that feeling where you identified with that? And the only way you, you can do that is by listening to that style of music. Yeah, and let me let me ask you this question then. Um, what's interesting is the way you're having people think about jazz history, and now even, um, you know, we're talking about blues as well. You know, they're intertwined. 
you're not having us say like, okay, here's what I'm going to have you do. I want you to listen to this recording, this recording, this recording. You're saying, who do you like? And then who were they influenced by? And that's what you want to do. But when you're teaching in a college setting though, um, I guess you have to be more generic, so to speak. And you have to say, okay, so we're going to be learning about jazz history. We're starting from the beginning. Um, so if we approach it that way for people, um, what would you recommend for, uh, like, let's say, you know, jazz saxophone history, what for you were the most monumental, important, influential recordings that people should absolutely listen to? Well, of course, you have to know the, the, the Coleman Hawkins soul, I think it's 1939, somewhere around there, of, of body and soul. That was the solo that put the saxophone in the forefront as a solo instrument. And there's a lot of things that's important about that recording, you know, beyond being that one, he barely played the melody. It was pretty much solo through him through it. But then harmonically, these things that people think are advanced, he was doing it back then, tritone substitutions and all this, and all this, you know, my students transcribe, I was like, wow, I'm like, see what you're playing is not new. <laughs> you know, Sidney Bechet and these guys were playing that stuff way before. Um, I, I can't pick like specific records, um, but yeah, that, I mean, it's just like um, listening to um, Illinois Jacquette playing Flying Hole solo. Those are, those are things that you're supposed to know. I mean, you know, you get into Johnny Hodges, I mean, just all, I mean, you could pick any one of those songs, take the A Train, later Isfahan, um, A Flower is a Lonesome Thing, Come Sunday, you know, um, I mean, so many, so many different compositions that you could pick from, from Johnny Hodge, the same thing with Benny Carter. Um, I would just say, find out, you know, like, like I did in your class or when I taught jazz history, um, I think if I would teach it again, I would do it a similar way, but I would, I would have the, these are the key figures chronologically. And I would just have just a few recordings of each and things I would pick things that for me are important for them stylistically and it would be something different for each one of them. And the thing is they're one person. So you could pick any one of their recordings. There's going to be a lot of similarities because it's the same person, you know, um, the only difference is, um, through time and you can, you can, you can like trace them chronologically through their period. Cause if you listen to John Coltrane, he has different periods where he sounds totally different. You know, when he, when he was with Thelonious Monk, when he was with Miles Davis, when he went into this 1960 with his first quartet, you know, and then how he developed and we get into like home and interstellar space and all of this stuff, you know, where he sounded, where he sounded totally different. You know, which and he's a great study. And John Coltrane was really smart because John Coltrane played with Johnny Hodges in those small groups when he left Duke Ellington. He played with Errol Bostic and Errol Bostic's band. Errol Bostic's band was was very, very important. And if you were in his band, you had to sight read your butt off. If you couldn't sight read, you got fired. You know, John Coltrane was smart enough to get with Thelonious Monk and Miles. He aligned himself with the with the visionaries, with the people in the vanguard, with people that could teach him. So he had, he had that foundation. Same thing with Dexter Gordon. Dexter Gordon was with Louis Armstrong, you know? And then you had um, um, Billy Eckstein's famous big band that, you know, that had Charlie Parker and, and Dizzy Gillespie and all these people, you know? So it's like doing your due diligence homework. So students, I mean, you, they, have, they have all this YouTube and, I mean, they have more stuff than I ever had. You know, we had tapes and, and things like that. But, you know, you can actually go on YouTube and type in somebody's name. And you'll see videos of them. You can, you can watch it. It's just like, or you do uh, Spotify, whatever stuff is, and you can put in a song. And you can hear like 10, 15 different recordings of the same song and hear how different people approached it. You know, so it's really about how curious you are as a player, you know, um, as, as a student of the music. And the, like I said, the, the deep thing about it is you'll hear recording at 18 and you'll hear recording at 28 and 38 and 40 and 58. It's going to sound different to you every time yeah. because your musical taste might change and things that you paid attention to, you might not pay attention to as much and you pay attention to something else. You're like, wow, I didn't hear that. Like I said, I used Charlie Parker as my gauge. You know, at first it was about the notes and I was like, wow, you know, how did it feel? wow, where did he place that note? Wow, how did he play that that concert E flat um, in the middle register of the saxophone? You know, um, wow, listen to his vibrato. 
listen to his sound, you know, it's like so many different things. His groove, how he plays with the rhythm section, it's, it depends on what you're listening for. You know, this is, this is actually really fascinating. And, and I, the question that comes to mind um, is something that you said before, and, and, and I'm going off of like, you know, um, we need to be entertainers and all that kind of thing. And, you know, unfortunately jazz or uh, jazz is not as popular as when we were growing up, you know, and even mm -hmm. before then, right? That was mm -hmm. the epic of the time in the 50s and the 60s. And it's not, it's not necessarily the music of the time now. And what, I'm wondering if that can come back, you know, with these, like you see like the Chad Lefkowitz Browns, you know, a great, great player, great technique. Um, out here we have Alex Hahn, you know, um, the Alex Hahn that's with Marcus Miller. You know, you've got uh, Alexa Tarantino, um, Camille Thurman. That's what I was thinking about, Alexis from Juilliard. Exactly, thank you. Yeah, and Melissa Aldana. You know, you've got, you got these younger yeah. players here, right? Um, Jeff Coffin, you know, I'm thinking about people that are also great jazz musicians, Bob Reynolds, who are playing, you know, playing with like pop figures and stuff like that. Um, do you think maybe like this is like the different evolution where, where jazz is starting to intertwine with what, you know, the popular mu music is of today, the R&B, the, um, you know, the hip hop, um, just, you know. Um, it's, but what you're saying is not new. It's, it's not a new thing. I mean, it, it, it always happened, you know, like, Motown, most of those guys, Idris Muhammad and all those guys were jazz musicians. So some of the famous recordings that we know were jazz musicians playing what became R&B. You know, the jazz musicians were the ones that started R&B, you know. Um, you got the Kamasi Washington, you got the, the um, you got Dante Winslow, you got um, um, Terrence Martin, you got Keon, um, Keon, with the trumpet player, Keon, you got Christian Scott, you got, um, you know, uh, back then it was T.O. Joe's Avery and um, Kiana Beasley Abel with Lauren Hill. Um, Roy Hargrove was at the beginning of all that stuff, you know, with Guru and, you know, the beginning of that, that mix of, of R&B and jazz, you know, all the guys were common, um, you know, so it's, it's not, it's not, an, it's not a, um, a new phenomenon for that to happen. That's how we had jazz rock fusion. <laughs> you know, yeah. or, or everything else. So I think what what music should represent, and I've been thinking about this a lot lately, like, yeah, Cole, um, Cole Porter, Rogers and Hart, um, Gershwin, great music. Nothing wrong with that music. We call them standards now because people have been playing them for many years, jazz, jazz musicians were playing them, but why did they play them in the beginning? Because they were the popular songs of that period. You know, all those Broadway shows, they were show tunes and people knew them. So if you recorded that, that was popular, right? But now we're in a, we're in a different time. Even now, you know, those, those, those songs are great songs to know because they're great melodies. It, for me, it's like we learn them because they're beautiful melodies. But again, you do have, you have the Motown, you have Stax. Um, you have like, um, like I said, you have the Beatles, you have, you know, you have like um, the Rolling Stones, you have Bob Marley, you have all of that stuff in that period, Queen and all those names. But then you have, you know, Janet Jackson, you have, you know what I mean? It's like you, our, our thing, if we're being true to our generation, the kids or the young musicians have to blend with the Erica Badu's and, 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 and all that stuff, you know? Look at look at Miles Davis. He did that, yeah. you know, yeah. all the way to the end. And I and I saw those bands with Kenny Garrett and Foley and Ricky and all those guys. I saw that band many many times. And he was playing. What was he playing? Time after time, playing Human Nature, um, Choo Choo, Amandala, all that stuff. You know, it was like a blend. Miles Davis was always at that. That's why you had the Birth of the Cool and all these different names and stuff. Because he was always he knew and he talked about that that. You can't just stay in the past. Music has to move forward. And the rhythm, the rhythm and everything changed. I remember a long time ago, I was on the West Side Highway with my girlfriend at the time. And um, it was like a traffic jam. You know, West Side Highway is always backed up. So I had on WBGO, the jazz station in New York City, right? So we're sitting there and we're just talking, listening to something. And I'm looking across the street and you can see people rollerblading and biking, you know, across the across the the, the, um, the highway and I'm listening to the music 
and I'm looking at the people and I'm listening to the music and I'm looking at the people and it didn't sync up. Mm. And so I changed to like um, Hot 97 R&B station. And all of a sudden it was like, zoom. Wow. I mean, literally that like that. So it was like, it was like a black and white movie. And when I changed the station, it became color and everything synced. And I said, wow, this is deep. This is deep because the rhythm in the street is different. The way people walk, the way people talk, the way they move is, is different from 1950. This is 2020. So something has to be different. Yes, we want to study the masters. We want to go back and know the evolution. But this is where it is right now. And if you're going to be true to your generation, you have to be true to that. So you have to know, like I said, you have to know the D'Angelo's, the Erica Badu, and and the new names of the people that are playing out. You know who's smart like that? Herbie Hancock. Her, Herbie's another one in the forefront. A, a lot of the electronic music is because of Herbie Hancock. You know, some yeah. a lot of the innovations and stuff because he was curious and, and moving forward. And he's playing with a lot of those young guys. You know, he's still keeping himself current. He's keeping himself relevant, even though he's an icon, Herbie Hancock, you know. And, you know, he's given that tradition plus moving forward. So... I think it's I think it's very 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 important that you have to be true to your to your your situation in the time that you're in now. You know, it's nice it's nice to hear like some young guys and they play the music and it sounds traditional and it's good. But at a at a certain point, I'm bored because I'm like, okay, now let's hear what you're doing. Yeah, and you know? You know, speaking about times right now, so we're you know we're recording this. I mean, the coronavirus pandemic. It's still happening. It's just that people are allowed to, you know, have to go out a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But we're also in the period of Black Lives Matter, where people are actually finally listening and paying attention. And where do you see jazz, you know, fitting in with that, helping this movement in these times, if anything? Well, I mean, I see a lot of my friends and colleagues out there protesting. Um, I think at any time in history where there was war or struggle, something beautiful artistically comes out of it in response to that. I mean, that's why we got what we call jazz, you know, it came out of that. When we had World War I, we had the great big bands, you know, World War II, music came out of that. Then we had the expatriates that stayed in Europe, you know, um, and going into bebop, going into the, the civil rights movement, and that's when you get John Coltrane and people like that um, speaking about what was going on. Even the bebop period was, a was you know, um, a voice on what was happening during that period, breaking away from the status quo and the young people speaking that voice in, in a way of, of, they did it through music. Um, I'm sure there are going to be some some um, musicians that are um, going to voice their their feelings and, op and opinions musically, and it's going to be pretty powerful. Um, and I'm sure they're doing that already um, online. I, I I kind of detach myself from it because it's kind of depressing what's going on right now. But it, I think some people are going to be more conscious of um, their place in the world. Some people are going to be angry. It's going to be angry music. Some people are going to be very spiritual. I remember um, just last week or a week and a half ago, Rachel Z did a live broadcast um, for the, I think, local 802. And she played by herself. And it was just so spiritual and beautiful. You know, it was like I needed it that day. Um, you know, so everybody has to find their way of expressing it, you know. Um, but I know within studying history, and I'm not a historian, but in every period, the music changed and it was because of these these things that were happening. You know, the Vietnam War, the Korean War, even Desert Storm and and, and even, you know, up until today, 9-11 and all these things. There's always been something happening artistically that changes. So um, if these young musicians study history and they're aware and they, they, they feel it, I'm sure we're going to hear some very interesting um, music. We're going to see some very interesting art. I have a brother in my Kung Fu school who's a very famous artist, and he did a piece the other day that was just like, wow, it was it was breathtaking, you know, Enrico, I can't think of his last name, but um, very, very talented artist. So, yeah, we, I think we, we, we wait and see. But 
as a as an African American man, I'm just like I'm tired. I'm just tired of the fight. You know, I'm just and you know, I I'm fifty one. I haven't seen anything like somebody like Mr. Heat or people like that, but I'm just tired. You know, you always have to feel like you have to you have to um be on guard because you don't know what's going to happen when you walk out your door, you know, that's real. That's real. You know, you, you, you have to be better. You have to be better. I mean, undisputedly, you have to be better for you to get the same kind of recognition for just being good. Um, I mean, there's so many things that like stigmas that are put on us and it doesn't matter if you have degrees, it doesn't matter if you're, you're, you're well-traveled, it doesn't matter your economic status, it doesn't matter anything. What a lot of people see is just the skin color. And, and it, really, it really rang true to me when I saw like President Obama. Mm -hmm. You know, had President Obama been a different skin color, he would have been the total American success story, you know? He, he, I mean, he went to Harvard, which is supposed to be the apex of education, and he was the president of the Harvard Law Society, you know, became a congressman and, and became the president of the United States, you know, but because of his skin color, that's all people chose to see. They, they, they didn't choose to see how brilliant it was. And those first four years, he was able to like, he was left with a mess. Donald Trump always talked about he was left with a mess. Nah. Yeah. <laughs> Obama was left with a mess. He had two wars. He had um, relationships around the world that were trashed. In the first four years, all he could do was damage control. We had a recession. You know, we had a lot of stuff going on that he was fixed that he doesn't get any credit for that some people are taking credit for now. Yeah. And, you know, in, in the second term, people were like, I don't care what he does. We're going to be opposed to that anyway. You know, just, you know, I mean... Could he have done a lot more? Yeah, but but we don't know what was stopping him from doing that, you know, and what challenges that he came across where he, but I feel like he, he gave the best he can. And it was it was beautiful for me as a person of color, that, you know, because, and my grandmother, who's 93 and people like that, Mr. Heath, they, they, they never thought they would see anything like that mm. in their lifetime. And it was like for some young child of color, whether black, Asian, Native American, or whatever. It gave them hope to say, yeah, you know, it is possible for you to be the president because that's what we heard in school. You know, George Washington never told a lie. He cut down the cherry tree. He said, I can't lie. I did it. You know, Abraham Lincoln freed the slave. I mean, you hear all these things about these presidents and the character of they, what they're supposed to do. And they, they, they plant that in your, in your head. But still, as a person of color, it's like, well, that's not going to happen for me because I ain't never seen no black president. They ain't gonna put no black words in it. And then you actually get a chance to see that. It's like, wow, this is possible. This is actually possible. You know, I can go to a good school. I can get an education. I can be a higher part of society. I can have respect. You know, so I, I like that aspect of it, but there's a there's a an old guard that's dying out. And they know they're dying out. And if this is their fight. This is their fight to try to hold on to this thing, but the world is changing. The world is mixing. People, people are coming together, different ideologies, religions, cultures, and they're coming in blending. And I really think that's the way it's supposed to be. You know, and there are people that are opposed to that for whatever reason. If you want to be white and you just want to deal, marry a white woman, cool. If you want to be black, you just want to marry black people or Asian, that's fine. It's like, but it's like, we're just human beings. Just fall in love with who you fall in love with. If you like stuff of the African-American, I love stuff in the Chinese culture. I'm not Chinese, but I've been to China many, many times. I study at Chinese martial arts. I like the food. I, I drink Chinese tea. I'm always drinking Chinese tea. You know, it's, it's just what I love, you know? And it's, I, just, I, just, I just hope that um, I get a chance to see a little bit of the change in my lifetime. But if you have parents that are raising their kids with the same kind of hate, it just perpetuates, perpetuates, and perpetuates, you know, and I don't, I don't know what the change is. I was just watching a video today. There was a protest. These people were driving past this pro protesting, and there was like a, a, a house 
with these um, white individuals and the guys had the Confederate flags and the one guy was leaning on a guy's neck as they were driving by and, and they were filming this and I, I couldn't believe it. I was just like, you know, that's, I can't, that's I, where they are. I, I'm, sp yeah. I'm speechless. I mean, I, I, um, I don't even know what to say. You know, it's, 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 uh, and, and you know, as a white person, I mean, th this is, this is, you know, it, this is eye opening for me. It's eye opening for a lot of us. And, and I think the, the important thing that you're saying here too, jazz has been a music that has, you know, reflected change, even brought about change all throughout, all throughout its history. And, and it's, it's been totally about democracy and an inclusion, yeah. you know, um, Louis Armstrong had white members in his band. Um, Teddy Williams, um, Teddy Wilson was with, with, with Benny Goodman, you know, um, and then you had um, Mill Hinton, you know, it's always been about inclusion, you know, uh, Thelonious Monk had Phil Woods and, you know, Louis Belson, you know, he was married to, I forgot who he was, he was married to an African American woman. You know, was, the music has always been about that because jazz, African American music, or American music, is about love. It's a, like I said, it's about democracy, it's about inclusion, it's about love, it's about honesty, and it's about spirit. So all of that other stuff that people project on the music is not the core and the soul of what the music is. So if if you're a, a, a Japanese player and you play your butt off, I remember I did a record, a recording. Um, with Johnny Griffin, it was me on alto, Johnny Griffin, and it was this Japanese tenor player named Sleepy Masamoto. Old man, well-dressed with his wife, and, you know, and when he picked up his horn, because I was curious, he sounded just like Lester Young. I mean, I mean, beautiful, big sound, and, I mean, and it was the spirit of the music. It wasn't like, you know, something else. It was the spirit of the music, and I was like, wow, he totally embraced the spirit of this music and it was beautiful to me and I go to different places in the world and you, you still feel that and it, this is the one place you know art has always been the one place where we can just get away from all of that we should and we can just come together it doesn't matter white red blue purple brown it's just like let's just play some music and I, that's what I would like to see continue you know I was going to China a lot and you know I was trying to tell these kids how important it is to know the culture and share with them about this music you know, and now I'm getting students from Taiwan, I'm getting students from Thailand, I'm getting students from China that are coming to study. But then when they come here, I tell them these things we've been talking about, how important it is to know the culture. It's not just going to school and learning scales, because that's how they're taught music, pretty much. Everything is about scales and patterns and, and progression. I'm like, yes, that's one part of it. But you came thousands of miles. You got to know about the people. This comes from a condition, and not just the generic sense of, yes, there were slaves and, and cotton field, blah, 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 but even more, deeper than that. If you like Charlie Parker, tell me about Charlie Parker. He grew up in Kansas City. What was happening in Kansas City when Charlie Parker was born? You know, who did he listen to? You know, of course, you know, he played with Jay Michan. Who was his, his Buster Smith was his teacher, and some of his influences, um, Count Basie, you know, the Blue Devils, what they would call them before then, you know, so I guess a, a lot of stuff that contributed to who Charlie Parker was before he got with Dizzy Gillespie and created this this um, genre of, of, of music or style of music that we call bebop, that the, the critics call bebop. So it's, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a sad time, you know, and like I said, for me, I try not to talk so much, but I'm just tired. I'm really tired of feeling like I have to prove myself that I'm worthy of, of respect. I'm worthy of um, something that I was born given as my right as a human being, you know, in terms of humanity. I don't want to drive in my car and see a, a police car go by and, and hoping, praying that this guy doesn't stop me for whatever, and it's happened. Yeah. You know, I just got my car, I had this convertible um, Volvo, just got it, brand new. And I'm, I'm driving one o'clock in the morning and I saw the cop car, I'm going this way, he's going this way and the cop looks in my car and does a U-turn. I'm like, oh shit, 
1.30 in the morning, so I'm already scared. And, you know, I had on a Volvo hat and everything. So I was like, yes, officer. And he said, he looked at me and he said, oh, yeah, yeah um, your back tail light is out. And got in his car and drove away. And I was like, that's not even possible because this is a brand new car. I mean, it could happen, but in no citation and nothing, then got in his car and drove away. Drove away. And those are the kind of things that we, we fear all the time. And when you see this stuff on the news, the only reason we're hearing about it now, because this is every day, this is nothing new. The, the knees on necks, everything is, 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 happens every day. It's just now you have video cameras and people can take clips of it. That's the only difference. You know, there are a lot of people that are, that are um, supposed to protect and serve in neighborhoods that they don't like the people in those neighborhoods. Or they don't, they don't know anything about the people in the neighborhoods. So if you have bias, you think everybody's an animal, you think everybody's a criminal, you're going to treat them like that. You don't have respect for them from the beginning. You're going to treat them like that. And, and these young people, I'm so excited to see these young people galvanizing themselves and protesting. You know, and, and, and making their voice heard that enough is enough. You know, that's that's really the only time that change happens anyway. You know, so it's time. It's it's time. And it, even if it's just a little step forward, that's wonderful. Because that's a step forward. For I think the it's gonna be I'm I'm I think I hope that it will be a big step forward because you know, the other component of that is that the media is paying attention more they have to pay attention now and when the media yeah. and more people who are in areas that you know don't hear about these stories hear about these stories and realize and and are shocked by what you go through every day and it, it's it's telling stories it's you know it's expressing music right telling stories it's the same thing that helps to change people yeah alabama John Coltrane about those little girls that got blown up in the church, you know? I mean, we could think of a lot. Of, I mean, uh, Max Roach, Freedom Songs. I mean, you know, I mean, Louis Armstrong was a great advocate for civil rights movement. People didn't realize the things that sacrifices he, he did in, in terms of um, the African-American community. But yeah, and, and I, you know, it's, it's a sad time. We're dealing with the, this virus. We're dealing with this civil unrest. But that means things are going to change. And I, I, I want to believe that there's going to be something beautiful on the other side of it. But we just have to be, we have to be in this. I mean, this is 450 years in the making. So we just, we, I don't know how long it's going to last, but we have to be in this. And it's very, very important that young people feel like they have a voice in terms of voting. You know, a lot of people didn't vote last time. And that's why we're in the situation that we're in because you know, whether you didn't like Hillary or whatever, you didn't feel like your vote counted, you still needed to vote because, you know, people have given their lives, especially people of color, have given them lives just for that right to be able to do that. So, I mean, that's the least you could do is get out there and vote, you know, and, you know, it's, um, I, I look at everything as yin and yang, you know, um, there's positive and there's negative and within negative there's positive and within positive there's negative and it and it, it's always changing so we're just in like a negative period but there's good inside of it these are the protests these are the people that are getting aware these are the people not of color that saying we don't want this to happen either and we support your cause that where they didn't support the cause before but they didn't know how or they were afraid to they they, they understand that things must change because we just want the same thing around the world. We just want to be happy. We want to love. We want to have our family. And we want to just enjoy life. It's very, it's very, very simple. That's, that's, that's all we want and have a quality of life, you know. And we're all different. You know, we, we're all different, but we're all the same. <laughs> you know what I mean? We're all different. We're all the same. So what, in terms of me, the music that I create um, in the future and how I play will represent what you hear me talking right now. You know, um, I wrote a composition a long time ago called The Community, just because of this kind of stuff. You know, it was like, I see the fracture in the community in terms of how people interact. And I was like, I want to write a composition that, of my feeling of like, come on, let's get this together. We don't have to be like this. You know, I don't know, you know, what it is. My teaching, you know, is like, I want people to be aware of history, but I want people to be positive too. 
want people to, to love each other. I don't speak Korean. I don't speak Chinese, but I love you as a human being. And, and, and you know, certain things I don't know about your culture, so teach me. And I'll teach you about mine, you know? Um, yeah, so it's, it's um, yeah, we're just, we're, we're in an interesting part of history and we're, we're watching change. We're watching a civilization change and hopefully it will change in a way, in a good way, because there are a lot of great civilizations that went through things like this and then it was the demise of that civilization. You know, so hopefully that doesn't happen in America. You know, but I think one of the generals said, if this continues to be the end of this uh, experiment, <laughs> this is American experiment, I hope that doesn't happen. I hope some beautiful things come out of it. But and some people have to suffer for the mass. Some people have to take it for the mass for things to be better. You know, and I'm willing to do that if I can make it better for the next generation. And that's all I've tried to do through education because I've been through some shit, excuse my language, where, where I wanted to give up. But I didn't give up because I, I knew how important that it was for me to give to the people, to the younger people, because the experiences that I'm giving them are not just somebody that went through academia. I've been doing it for 30 years with the masters. I've actually played and been with the masters for 30 years. So um, I'm giving you something that you're not just getting in books. Absolutely. And, and, um, and we're going to cover, you know, more about you in, um, in a part two of this podcast, but I just want to say this, you know, I totally respect you. I honor you. And I, I never forgot your class at Queens college. And I knew of you from your recordings, <laughs> you know, I was like, Oh my God, Antonio Hart's teaching this class. I can't believe it. I've got to take it, you know, um, you know, just, just your influence in jazz, you know, at that time. And, um, you know, thank you for being so honest and forthright and thank you for sharing all of your knowledge um you know of, of saxophone of history and it's just uh this has really been an incredible podcast and i think a gift to the listeners of this podcast thank you so much thank you for having me i wish i knew more i don't i don't really know much i'm, I'm trying to study now there's so much i feel like i need to learn but i, I have been blessed with some experiences and, and um if i can share it with people and it benefits them I'm, I'm, i feel very happy and the beautiful thing for someone at your level, you know, you, you know, your level of playing, your level of performance, your level of understanding, it's so important for people to hear you say stuff like that. And even before alluding to Jimmy Heath, always studying, always learning, people think that people get to a certain level and it's like they stop learning. That's not the truth. In fact, the more, the better you get, the more you want to learn, the more curious, as you always say, the more curious you get, and that's how you learn. And I think that's been such an important point that you've brought out that curiosity you know don't stop being curious be curious if mm -hmm. if you if your you know first experience with saxophone is david sanborn you know be curious about who he listened to who he studied with you know who his influences were and then that'll bring mm -hmm. you to other people that you'll be like oh okay wow that's really cool who did they study with you know i think that was such that's such a great point that you bring out that is so um accessible now because again, when we grew up, there was no YouTube. You know, we didn't have computers in schools. <laughs> it was until mm -hmm. much later. You know, so mm -hmm. we had to, you know, do the legwork and find these things and go to libraries and find mm -hmm. things, go to record stores and, and you know, um, talk to people, you know, and get advice about who to listen to and, and what. Exactly. Exactly. You know? And now it's like maybe because people are overwhelmed, there's so much out there, they don't know what to do. But I think your point was so uh, practical. Who do you like? You know, why do you like them? Do they make you feel good? Okay, explore them. I think that's great. I think it's really, really powerful. Simple thank and you. powerful. Thank you so yeah. much, Antonio. I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, uh, you know. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>